buongiorno, buongiorno a tutti, e buona domenica e buona festa della Repubblica italiana. E siamo eh, oggi eh, in questo incontro per eh, parlare del climate change con una eh, INET lecture del professor Storm dal titolo Perché la strada per il pianeta Serra è la stricata di buone intenzioni. Eh, la strada per il pianeta Serra mi sembra un bellissimo titolo e, eh, con un gioco di parole in italiano che eh, spero che possa essere reso nella traduzione. E, mh, presento brevemente eh, il professor Serva Storm e eh, Ainet che è eh, l'organizzatore di questo evento. Eh, Serva Storm è eh, un economista eh, olandese eh, del Delft eh, University of Technology. Eh, si è occupato e si occupa prevalentemente eh, di macroeconomia e eh, è molto interessante perché non è, cioè non è eh, come dire, focalizzato in modo specialistico sul climate change, o almeno non lo è stato, e eh, applica quindi la sua eh, visione elaborata eh, nel corso della sua ricerca scientifica sulla macroeconomia, sul progresso tecnologico sui temi della distribuzione del reddito, eh, sui temi della finanza pubblica. In Italia è stato molto letto recentemente per un articolo sugli effetti dell'austerity eh, sull'economia eh, italiana, molto eh, letto, ne ho sentito anche molto eh, discutere, sulle, poi le questioni dello sviluppo della, della crescita per l'appunto e del cambiamento climatico. Uh, INET è l'Institute for New Economic Thinking uh, che um, ospita, organizza e ospita questo evento come altri eventi del Festival dell'Economia. Uh, um, qual è uh, la... Uh, Uh, lo dice la parola stessa per, for the new economic thinking per una visione critica dell'economia che sfida la saggezza convenzionale eh, quindi ehm, si propone, propongono delle idee e mi piace molto il loro motto che è eh, l'economia deve servire l'umanità eh, cosa di cui spesso nelle lezioni eh, di eh, economia da, motto da cui spesso nelle lezioni di economia a mio parere ci eh, allontaniamo. Vengo brevemente al tema di oggi, eh, perché le buone intenzioni? Eh, allora, prima di tutto dico buona una mia buona intenzione, penso che eh, è una discussione fondamentale, pensiamo tutti che sia una discussione eh, fondamentale, probabilmente i nostri incontri eh, e il nostro approccio all'economia eh, eh, in questo momento, in questo contesto eh, storico dovrebbe essere focalizzato solo su questo, dovremmo parlare, discutere, litigare, eh, proporre soluzioni, dividerci sulle soluzioni solo su questo e finalizzare e anche rileggere tutti i nostri problemi anche pesanti che abbiamo ereditato dal passato per l'appunto la situazione del declino economico italiano, il peso del debito pubblico, il problema demografico, però orientati in quello che è eh, attualmente la sfida più importante che abbiamo di fronte. Invece ci commuoviamo eh, quando vediamo i ragazzi di 15 anni che eh, fanno il loro sciopero, però poi dopo ritorniamo alle nostre discussioni abituali come se fosse uno dei temi che abbiamo di fronte e non quello da cui dipende la nostra eh, sopravvivenza. E, e soprattutto eh, spesso i discorsi sul cambiamento climatico sono eh, sulla discussione c'è o non c'è, ehm, gli stati concordano o non concordano, quindi questioni geopolitiche, e meno si ragiona sugli strumenti dell'economia, sull'impatto sull'economia, su cosa succede in questa finestra eh, di tempo che eh, abbiamo e che, come ci dirà eh, il professor Storm, si sta già chiudendo. E la cosa, ehm, che imparere, le cose che eh, cominceremo a imparare oggi sono eh, a, che condizioni, in qua, a che condizioni, cosa dobbiamo pagare, che costo eh, ha eh, affrontare questa grande sfida. È, eh, L'obiettivo della COP21, eh, um, dei due, eh, un grado e mezzo, due gradi di eh, temperatura, sembra un obiettivo piccolo, ma è un obiettivo che è una rivoluzione eh, per l'economia. Si, 
c'è una disruption, ci sarebbe una disruption molto eh, forte e importante che mette eh, in discussione il modo di, la produzione, il consumo, le istituzioni, il consenso, eh, la, la, nostra, la nostra convivenza, ma dobbiamo eh, affrontarla. Eh, L'approccio che sentiremo eh, da Serva Storm è eh, un approccio che non concede illusioni, anzi lui contesta eh, una visione troppo edulcorata eh, delle, eh, delle sfide che abbiamo di fronte, eh, sostiene che appunto la strada per, eh, per il pianeta Serra, per il surriscaldamento del pianeta è la stricata di buone intenzioni. Se, eh, eh, le buone intenzioni il motto è che eh, la strada per l'inferno è eh, la stricata di buone intenzioni e, e che quella ambientale è eh, una sfida che comporta una rivoluzione e come diceva qualcuno la rivoluzione non è un pranzo di gala ci spiegherà perché eh, il professor Storm a cui cedo la parola yes. um. Thank you very much for your very uh, uh, elaborate introduction, not just to my presentation, but to my, uh, let's say, to the, uh, my, my broader work. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very uh, grateful to the Institute for Economic Thinking and the Trento Fest Festival for inviting me. Uh, and uh, today uh, I am going to speak uh, about a paper which I wrote uh, jointly with my colleague, uh, Enno Schröder, on, uh, uh, let's say, climate change, or the, the economics of climate change, and the, ti the paper is titled like, why, uh, why the Road to Hothouse Earth uh, is Paved with Good Intentions. And uh, the presentation has a twist, because uh, in addition to speaking about, um, or to give, uh, in addition to what I see as my take on the state of the climate and the climate uh, economics, uh, I'm also going to uh, talk about uh, more the, the economic structural side of it uh, and the, maybe the political side of it, that is uh, climate change policies in uh, especially the OECD economies, uh, OECD economies which are growing more and more polarized and I call those polarized economies dual economies. Yeah? I'll come to that at the end of my talk. Now to uh, start off the talk, uh, I first want to uh, sort of s tell a story, uh, and um, uh, that is also because I heard that the young scholars of INET uh, have been working on trying to use popular literature in their work or their presentations, and uh, since my name was mentioned there, I think I have to sort of try and do justice to that uh, reputation. So I will not talk about uh, the uh, Hunger Games, I want to uh, uh, refer to another book, a very recent book by an American novelist uh, called Nathan Hill, and the book is called The Knicks. It's an enormously thick, fat book, and I will not speak about the book itself. I just want to highlight the title, The Knicks. The Knicks is uh, N-I-X. It is uh, supposed to be a Norwegian uh, uh, mythical figure, actually sort of a ghost, and that ghost can take different shapes, and uh, it, the per what the ghost does is sort of it tricks people, it seduces people to uh, do things which are wrong. And one of the forms, uh, one of the shapes this Nyx takes is the shape of a very beautiful and powerful horse. And uh, one day a Norwegian boy goes to the sea, to the cliffs, and he meets this horse, a horse. He doesn't know that it is a Nix, but he thinks it's the most beautiful horse in the world. And the horse is very friendly and basically invites him to jump on and ride. And the boy is very anxious and reluctant and he doesn't want to, I mean, he's fearful, he, thought, and he thinks what, what to do, but he does it. And then the horse starts to very smoothly, gently walk a little bit faster and the boy gets courage and he becomes more confident, and the horse goes faster and even faster. And at some point, uh, this young man becomes utterly uh, excited, and he thinks that he is actually riding the best possible horse, and he must be the best possible rider in the world. I mean, he's sort of the master rider, master of the universe. 
And uh, right at that point, when he thinks two things, that is, he is in control, and he is really doing something excessively uh, superior to what other people do, right at that point, when he becomes arrogant and so on, the horse jumps off the cliff and the boy dies. Yeah? So what is the story, uh, what has the story to do with the talk today? I think uh, two things, or the two things I mentioned, that is this notion that we are in control. We are talking about climate change and there is a very fundamental issue of being in control of climate, of climate processes, of environmental processes in general. And I think we have a sort of false consciousness, a sort of uh, fake uh, idea that we are in control. Yeah, we can actually sort of let the temperature go up by one or two or maybe three degrees and still uh, be in charge. That is, the, that is one uh, sort of uh, thing which corresponds to that story. And the other part is sadly the fact that the story didn't end well. Yeah, I mean, there is a big, big risk that the story of climate change is also not going to end well. There is hubris, there is arrogance, there is this fake consciousness that we are in control, and I think uh, this is sort of uh, a very telling example of uh, yeah, where we as humans have to be more honest. Yeah, uh, Actually, I put as a motto to the paper, and then I will start with my talk, that uh, I think it is a quote from Ludwig von Wittgenstein that nothing is more difficult than not to deceive oneself. And I think that is one of the issues. Yeah? I'll first speak about climate change. Uh, I will not necessarily go into the, uh, let's say, the climate or the physical uh, side of, the climate of, of, of climate change, but we know that the fact that we have, after 1800, have been dumping massively uh, carbon and other greenhouse gas gases into the atmosphere where they are absorbed. Uh, the concentration of carbon and greenhouse gases in the atmosphere has increased over time. And uh, we know from science that this is uh, uh, associated, it is leading, it is causing uh, a gradual, not totally predictable, uh, uh, increase uh, in uh, the global temperatures over and above what would be the natural pattern of global temperature change. Yeah, this is called enhanced uh, climate change. Enhanced, the, the, the temperature increase, uh, let's say, caused by, uh, uh, by economic uh, and human uh, interventions. That is production, uh, transportation, travel, consumption. We, are all, we all emit carbon, and the carbon ends up in the atmosphere. It forms a sort of a blanket. It stays there. It's sort of a blanket. Uh, uh, the, the, the Earth is wrapped into, in, in a blanket. With increasing atmospheric co uh, concentrations of carbon, Carbon, the blanket becomes thicker, and uh, that more and more warmth is sort of trapped under that blanket. And that is, this, that is the process of global warming. I just have the graph here of uh, carbon, and we know that it is sort of due to uh, growing and growing carbon emissions. Uh, th this is the, uh, the first graph which shows growing carbon emissions, and you can see that it is still rising. Uh, the red uh, share is the Chinese uh, contribution to global carbon emissions, and I think the light bluish share is the US uh, uh, share. Uh, and uh, I mean, there are, all, there are all these stories about China being the biggest carbon emitter. Yes, that's true, but if you calculate this per person, China is not by far not the biggest carbon emitter. I'll come back to this. The other part of the graph is uh, average temperatures, and if you look at, the, I mean, this is uh, the, the 10 hottest year, years uh, on, uh, on historical record. And actually, the five hottest years were the previous five years. Yeah, I'm not sure whether today or this year is going to break uh, another the, the 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 current record, but it uh, it might very well do so. Yeah, let me. Oops. Yeah. Okay, uh, let me go to the problem setting. I think the problem setting is this, that uh, there is, what climate science is telling us is that if we continue on the current business as usual path, 
uh, atmospheric concentrations of carbon will increase to such an extent that uh, the process of global warming uh, becomes uncontro uncontrollable, unstoppable. Yeah, there are thresholds, there are all kinds of cascading effects. Uh, I, don't go in, I, would, I don't want to go into all the details, but uh, there is a consensus that we should limit atmospheric carbon concentrations in order to keep the increase in warming, the increase in temperature uh, to less than 2 degrees or even preferably to less than 1.5 degrees compared to the average global temperatures around 1800, let's say. Yeah, uh, there are all other, uh, I mean, the climate change itself is already having impacts on biodiversity and so on. I, I don't think I have to go through all the uh, deta details of this. Yeah, so th there is a risk of unstoppable, uncontrollable climate change. The further problem, there's a next problem, is that uh, the problem is the, the, time lim the time window for climate action, that is for trying to slow down, slow down warming, is uh, the time window is not very large. Yeah, we are emitting about, let's say, 40 uh, uh, gigatons of carbon each year. The, uh, the view, the general view is that the remaining carbon budget, that is the amount, is basically the amount of uh, uh, atmospheric space which we have to dump carbon, I mean, the, to dump carbon in, uh, is, uh, is about 400 gigaton. And if you take the uh, ratio of the two, you will see it's about 10 to 12 years. Uh, if, if we continue to emit 40 gigatons, it is about 10 to 12, 15 years. And we are actually, uh, uh, we have raised atmospheric carbon concentrations to such a degree that there is no, uh, it, it, is, it becomes very likely that we cannot keep uh, global warming to below two degrees. And then we enter what in, it, uh, in, in Latin, maybe in Italian as well, is called terra incognita. Yeah, we don't know where we will, uh, where we will end up. Yeah, uh, it is true that the carbon budget, this notion of 400, ton, uh, 400 gigatons is itself uh, uncertain. Some people say there is a, actually zero or negative carbon budget left, which means we are already on the, going down on the road to hothouse earth. Uh, there are people who are saying it's much bigger, 800 tons, uh, 800 gigatons. I, I think that discussion is maybe not so interesting. It's, it's 10 years, maybe it's 20 years, uh, but the way things are going, uh, even 20 years is not very long. Yeah, the, oops. So we have climate change, we have a time limit, and then in addition we have a very interesting and also problematic difference of views. Yeah, there are climate scientists who act like Cassandra, that is basically predicting disaster. Uh, and there are, uh, uh, let's say, especially economists and also many policymakers who, uh, well, not totally trivialize the problem, but who argue that the problem is not so urgent as the uh, climate scientists are making out. Yeah, the, uh, there's pessimism uh, in the climate science community, you could say. Uh, how can we stop, I mean, things are going wrong, how can we stop it? Uh, the approach by economics or economists is different. It is very much in the sort of attitude of this boy riding the Knicks. We are in control, yeah, we are in control. Uh, I am citing President, former President Obama, who is saying that, yeah, I mean, the, the economy is growing, but we are also decoupled, the U.S. is decoupling. Uh, emissions are going down while the economy is expanding. So look, we are sort of solving, we are quite ahead in solving the problem. And then we have, uh, as an example, uh, the 2018 Nobel Prize winning economist, Yale economist, William Nordhaus who is a very famous, uh, sort of very sophisticated climate, uh, eco uh, climate economist, but his models, I'll come to it later, uh, his models also caution. They basically say, yes, there is a problem, climate change is happening, but uh, it is a gradual process, we can control it, actually we can optimize it, we, we can find the optimal path, uh, uh, and the optimal path from an economic point of view is to go very slow on climate action. That is basically, we can afford to not take much action now, but by 2030 and maybe by 2015, we have 50, we have to become more serious. So there is time, yeah, it, it's not sort of a big, big uh, problem. 
Okay, that gives rise to my questions. Uh, we had all the climate conferences, we have all good intentions uh, in, with the Paris Agreement. Uh, some uh, go uh, governments are renegotiating on their good intentions, uh, so they're basically saying we are going to withdraw from the pair. But anyway, there are good intentions. But then the questions are, okay, what has been ac accomplished so far? That's the first one. The second one is what will be needed if we want to keep warming uh, down to less than 1.5 or 2 degrees? S the third question is, can we do it? Uh, is it very costly or is it tec uh, tec technically not feasible? And uh, it suppose it is feasible, uh, how do we do it? What kind of policies do we need? Yeah? I will first uh, uh, guide you to, uh, the first, uh, to my, what my answer is to the first question. What has been accomplished so far? Well, I think the picture is not too rosy. Yeah? Not, I mean, we saw in the first graph already that emissions are continuing to increase for the globe, for the world. And if you look at the, if you look at those Im the, the, the changes in emissions over time uh, in a more uh, detailed manner, and you can do that using the so-called Kaya identity, uh, then uh, it makes it, 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 a more nuanced or big, a clearer picture becomes, uh, uh, co comes out of that. Now, the Kaya identity, I will not go through the uh, exact equation, but the Kaya identity is actually saying that global emission, the, the change in global emissions can be decomposed into, let's say, what we can call a scale uh, factor. That is uh, the population, how big, I mean, more people means more economic uh, production means more emissions. Then income per person, there's also a scale factor, that is the, the richer the, we are, the more we consume, the more we uh, use and consume carbon intensive goods, so the more will be emissions. So the two f population and GDP per person concern scale. And then the other two factors, that is uh, uh, emissions per unit of energy, that is, that is carbon intens intensity of energy supply, and energy per unit of GDP, which is sort of the energy in, uh, intensity of, of the economy, of, 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 of income. Those two factors have to do with technology, yeah? I mean, there is a, so we have scale and we have technology. Now, let us look at uh, what has been achieved so far. And, uh, okay, we have a detailed pic uh, table. I will not go through all the numbers, but uh, you can see that uh, throughout the period 1971 to 2015, global emissions, total global emissions, have been growing at 1.9% per year. These are, these, the numbers are average annual growth rates. Yeah? The, the driver, the main driver of global emissions is the scale factor, that is population growth, one, and growth of the economy, that is growth of real per capita income. Taken together, they, I mean, the scale factor would have, uh, on its own, would have led to uh, a, an emission growth of 3.4%, yeah, much higher than what it actually was, but uh, this is like the, the push which comes out of the, the growth of the economy, you could say. Then the scale growth, scale factor growth is offset, partly, by technology, especially by uh, improvements, by reductions in energy intensity per unit of GDP. So we, the world has become more efficient in terms of using energy and creating in income uh, per unit of energy. Uh, and you can also see there is a very small, minus 0.5, there's a very small reduction in the carbon intensity of energy supply. So okay, there is also a little bit of decarbonization, but it's, very, it's, it's not very strong. Uh, the table also gives information uh, for the OECD and for China. Uh, you can see that emissions, total emissions in the OECD are also growing, still growing. Yeah, it's not that we are, that emissions are declining. Uh, the emission growth in China is 5.73% per year for a period of 40 so many years, and that is quite uh, uh, a big number. It is mostly driven, I mean, if you look at the China especially, you can see that it is mostly driven by the scale factor, that is economic growth. And uh, China has done a remarkable uh, job, you could say, in improving over time the energy uh, efficiency of production. That is, the energy intensity per unit uh, of GDP has come down by almost 4% per year, which is much 
higher than what the OECD countries managed to achieve. Okay, low-hanging fruit and so on. China could do it, but they do it. The problem is carbon intensity is not coming down and the scale. I mean, the Chinese economy is, is growing enormously. Yeah? Now, uh, this suggests that the, de the decoupling or let's say the, the de decarbonization is not happening in a strong enough way. Decoupling is not so clear. These are average numbers. So we can also look at country numbers, country specific uh, uh, patterns, and we can ask the question, uh, has there been decoupling? Yeah, the question could be, uh, is, o is Obama correct in assuming that there is uh, some evidence of, however recent, of uh, decoupling? Now, to do so, uh, we make a distinction between two kinds. We measure carbon emissions in two ways. One is production-based carbon emissions, and the other one is consumption-based carbon emission, emissions. And the difference is sort of very straightforward. Production-based is all the emissions happening in Italy, within the borders of Italy, in a particular year. And consumption-based emissions are all the emissions associated with average consumption levels in Italy uh, that is with the, good, with, the, with the goods produced and consumed, and that includes many goods which are not produced within Italy, but which are exported from China or whichever country. Yeah, so the difference is that if a country, uh, uh, let's say some countries, I'll go to the next uh, slide, let's say in general it is true that richer countries uh, have outsourced industrial production to China, and other Asian countries on a massive scale. And not uh, outsourcing industrial manufacturing production is not just outsourcing jobs, it is also outsourcing carbon emissions. So the carbon emissions are happening in China and not in Italy or the US. Yeah? So what happens is for the rich countries, these con the consumption-based emissions, which is emissions associated with standards of living, uh, uh, tend to be higher than uh, production-based emissions. We have cleaned our economy by basically uh, shifting uh, carbon-intensive production to other places. Yeah, and the, the, the reverse, the other vice versa, the reverse ho holds true for developing countries like China and, other, uh, China and India. Uh, their production-based emissions tend to be much higher. I have a table to illustrate this. Uh, the first column gives the difference between consumption-based emissions and production-based emissions in the year 2011. And you can see that it is quite, like for Germany, which is known to be very pro-green uh, and so on, ge the consumption-based emissions are nevertheless, or nevertheless, are 11% higher than production-based emissions, yeah? And uh, for the UK, it's, 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 it's huge. For Italy, it's also huge. And China, India, and South Africa have a minus sign, which means production-based emissions are higher than the consumption-based emissions. The second column is just there for a little bit of, uh, sort of, is, is there for uh, purposes of a reality check. That is, uh, it is basically uh, the consumption-based carbon emissions in different countries per person, I, I forgot to put per capita or per person, but it is per person, uh, uh, compared to uh, av uh, average per capita uh, CO2 emissions in the US. And what you can see is that in most, let's say in most European countries, uh, per capita carbon emissions are about 50% of US carbon emissions. And if you compare it to India and China, you can see India is really almost pathetic, like 8% of US emissions per person. And in China, it's about 28%. Yeah, so uh, per person, we have a huge uh, difference here. And uh, it also made me think that if the US could manage without sort of re really losing in terms of quality of lifestyle or whatever to reduce its emissions down to the level of the EU, that would already save a lot of carbon. But anyway, that is a, that is a specific uh, issue. Yeah, uh, so what has been, what is the evidence? So we talk about uh, decoupling and production-based emissions and carbon-based emissions. People who want to know more about it can go to the paper, which is an INET working paper, number 84. It's available on the INET website. Uh, it basically presents an econometric in in investigation of what is called the carbon, the, the carbon Kuznets curve based on input-output data 
Uh, it is sort of uh, relatively long term. It has many, I mean, it has all these different industries, and we also use four different good sources on input. It's not just one input-output source. We have multiple sources. And uh, we uh, estimate it. Uh, we try to test whether there is, there is decoupling or no decoupling. Now, let us first look at production-based emissions. Yeah? Remember that production-based emissions are lower in the rich countries because we basically uh, have exported our, emission, our emissions. Now, in, if we use production-based data on emissions and, uh, and data on per capita income, uh, we find with a, with a sample for 40 countries for 1995 up to uh, 2011, and actually we have updated the analysis to 2015 and there is not much of a difference, we find that there is decoupling. So yes, uh, once inco incomes, incomes increase, but then at, at some point there's a turning point and with higher incomes, emissions per person go down. But the trouble is that the turning point is uh, reached only at very high levels of income uh, let's say $56,000, but that is in 2005 prices. And it basically means that the turning point is useless for purposes of uh, thinking about climate uh, action or climate policy, because if we, uh, if we let economies grow and reach that turning point, uh, we will definitely uh, go beyond the available carbon budget, and we are definitely going down uh, much higher warming than two degrees. Yeah, uh, the numbers are given here. I don't go into the specifics, but it is like uh, there is a turning point, yes, but uh, for all practical purposes, it is not very uh, useful. Now, if we go to consumption-based emissions, the story is really different, and I think consumption-based emissions are more relevant. That is standards of living. This is what we actually use and consume, including all the goods produced in China, with all the emissions happening in China. I mean, we are buying those goods. Then what we find is there is no decoupling at all. Yeah, it's just a linear, I mean, higher income means per capita means higher emissions per capita. And this goes, this goes on into infinity, it seems. Yeah, there is simply no uh, evidence of decoupling, which means that uh, if we take uh, seriously consumption-based emissions, it turns out that Obama is wrong, but we, it, it's, not good, it's not good news. What it means is, as I wrote in bigger letters, is that, yes, I mean, we have to change. We have to make, we have to do things differently. The future has to be different. We cannot sort of say, okay, let's continue with current patterns. There has to be something drastically happening. Uh, let, permit me to uh, say one more thing about the scale effect and why the consumption-based uh, uh, emissions are not uh, decoupling. I mean, I think we all recognize this pattern. I mean, I'm old enough, if I go back to when I was young, uh, I think most people were buying, their, their, most families were buying their first television uh, uh, set. It was not a set, it was just a very black and white thing. And we, everyone is very happy with that thing. Now, and. I think it is very clear that over time, the energy efficiency of television screens has become much better, much higher. I mean, at the same time, uh, I mean, I think we had a, a television screen which was maybe 40 by 40 centimeters or something, and now uh, people have flat screens almost uh, for which could be used for in, in a cinema. And it's not just that they have one, I mean like this, and it's not that they have one flat screen uh, in their home. Actually, they have decorated all the, I mean the kitchen has a flat screen, all the children's rooms have flat. I mean, I don't have a television, to be honest. If I walk my dog in the evening, I can watch all shows, uh, the, the news uh, with, with subtitles, just by looking at, uh, th uh, through the windows of my neighbors, yeah, it's like, uh, now, that is, this is the scale effect, yeah, this is so, the, the television set has become more energy efficient, but everything has become bigger. We go for elect, elect, electric cars, fine, I mean, that is probably saving some uh, emissions, but I have not seen a small Fiat Panda electric car. I only see huge electric cars. Maybe the, the, maybe the weight is sort of, the material is also good, but anyway, it's, it's like, the scale effect overrides any gains we are making 
in uh, efficiency and carbon intensity. And I think that is a very, very important point. Yeah, so the future has to be different. Now, uh, we also, in the paper, we also look at the future and I think, uh, I would defend that we take a very, very optimistic view of the future, that is, we use the Kaya identity, we uh, take for, uh, as given, uh, we, we say, okay, let's suppose we uh, want to keep uh, global emissions uh, uh, to a level which is still compatible with two degrees, not 1.5, so it's two degrees, and so we know what the re emission reduction target is. Then we make very optimistic technological assumptions like uh, uh, the increase in energy or the decrease in energy uh, intensity is 2.7 percent, let's say, which is double what has been achieved so far. And for decarbonization, we basically assume there's aggressive decarbonization at a rate of 3.7 percent, while in reality the rate was, one, was 0. Uh, 0.15 percent. Yeah, so this is like a very, very uh, optimistic scenario. There is no uh, reason to assume that this will happen, but the uh, International Energy Agen Ag Agency and the OECD have scenarios in, in which they make these assumptions, uh, and uh, they apparently, I mean, their experts uh, apparently believe that it is uh, possible. Now, uh, what do we get if we, I mean, th the question we then ask is, how much economic growth, that is scale, how much, how much can the scale of the economy grow? Uh, if in a, situ in a very optimistic future in which uh, technology is not really a problem because we, are, we have very aggressive decarbonization and very strong improvements in, en in energy, in intense, uh, energy efficiency. Now the problem is that uh, the economic uh, per global per capita GDP growth which comes out is very low. Yeah, I mean, it's point, it, the number is 0.45%. It's basically zero. Uh, it also means that rich countries clearly cannot grow if poor countries, developing countries, need to grow. Yeah, so it also immediately opens up a box of conflicts between rich and poor or industrializing and post-industrial societies. Yeah, I am not saying that this is uh, um, uh, rocket science. I'm just saying that just for m m imposing consistency on the numbers, which is, I think, something which the uh, International Energy Agency is not necessarily doing, but we do it. Uh, we find that uh, the uh, uh, potential, let's say, climate constraint or global warming constraint rate of economic progress is not very low. And historically speaking, I mean, if we go look at the past uh, two, de two centuries, uh, it will be a problem. Yeah, it's, it's, a new, it's a new setting. You can also, I mean, you can also argue it will not happen. I mean, uh, the economy will grow more than this, yes. But the result will be more emissions and it will not uh, slow down or stop warming. Okay, now some good news. Yeah, uh, That is the scientists, climate scientists, but also en engineers. I work in a university of technology, so I regularly talk to engineers. Uh, they have a very, very strong can-do uh, me mentality, and they think, I mean, they still think that even though we have 12 years left, it can be done. Yeah, I mean, they know all the, the, all the things. Phasing out coal, that's immediate. Uh, scaling up renewables, um, strong measures to increase energy efficiency uh, in, in all kinds of uh, activities, uh, decarbonization, but also changing consumption patterns, yes, very problematic. No air travel, less meat consumption. I mean, all these things are maybe necessary. And then uh, CCS is carbon capture and storage. Uh, so, I mean, a whole package, I mean, you can call them wedges, wedges, or you can call them so many things, but there's a whole package of things which, if you combine them, they will, uh, they could, in principle, um, take care of reducing emissions at a pace and at a rate uh, compatible with, uh, let's say, the uh, 1.5 degree warming target. Yeah? Uh, now, then we come to a problem. And the problem is that most economists, not all, but many economists are, uh, are actually not so uh, positive about aggressive decarbonization, aggressive climate policies. So, I mean, it's not about Nordhaus, but uh, he is a very prominent uh, author in this area. And he's basically saying that from an economics point of view, 
uh, aggressive climate action decarbonization is not socially or economically optimal. And the argument is basically that this, the, the, the argument, I've summar summarized this argument in four points. It's basically uh, we need to invest in higher cost energy sources and all kinds of adjustments. These extra investments need to be financed. That requires, in his thinking, extra savings. The extra savings reduce today, today's cons uh, reduce consumption today. So it's basically like we have to invest for a better future, and we are paying this out of our pockets by um, uh, reducing consumption. Uh, so it is a, there is a welfare cost to it. The, these savings, then the argument goes, are not very well used because we can also invest them in other sources. Uh, we can grow our economies. We can even maybe put them in the bank and get a higher rate of return. And if we do that, we become richer over time, more wealthy, and uh, the bigger income, the, the, more, the increase in wealth, let's say by 2050, then allows us to pay for climate action uh, uh, and in relative terms that is compared to our level of material uh, standards of living, the, climb, the cost of doing this is, uh, is relatively small, smaller than when we start to do it today. Yeah? That means that in some, uh, although it, is, it looks like uh, intuitively incorrect and climate sciences scientists are also arguing against it, uh, from the economic point of view, the optimal strategy is to go rather slow on climate action. And maybe not do nothing, but uh, sort of introduce a carbon price or carbon tax and very slowly increase it from, let's say, $20 per ton of carbon now to $50 by 2050 to whatever, $100 in 2100. Yeah? So uh, there is a, there's a climate policy, but it's basic, there's no, no, no sense of urgency. Uh, again, it takes me back to the NICs. <laughs> Because it is, it is this. There is this idea that we are actually still in control. Yeah, we are sort of at a desk playing a game. How do you call that thing with the joys? This thing you use with gaming. I mean, a, a keyboard, and you press buttons, and you're still in control. I, I think we are not. Yeah. Okay. Now, I think there are major, major. Pro I'm not the only one, but I think there are major, major problems with this kind of argument. Uh, in a nutshell, you could say it is simply too mechanical, too deterministic, too uh, much uh, taken by uh, a, a, a false uh, idea of of being in control. Yeah. Uh, let me go quickly through the five uh, points of critique. One is uh, most of these climate. Uh, impact assessment models uh, uh, basically uh, ignore the uh, possibility of a very small probability of, uh, of very dangerous catastrophic climate change. Yeah? There are cost, there are damage functions in these models, and these models basically, the damage functions do not uh, allow damage to be, let's say, huge. Yeah? It's like the, it's still all uh, doable. The models are also very generally quite linear. They do not have self-reinforcing <laughs> mechanisms of cumulative causa causation, like, okay, we get after the threshold, we get uh, endogenous processes which reinforce global warming and which are un unstoppable. And they also think that climate change, the cost of climate change can be reversed. Yeah? I mean, if, clim if we allow temperatures to go, I and mean, this is a very simple argument, if we allow climate change to, uh, warming to go up to 2.5, 3 degrees by 2050, in the process we become richer. And by 2050 we can, uh, on average, we can actually, we, we, we can pay better for the climate policy investments. This is all true, but it is the average. And outside the average, there are real people whose lives have been ruined and real people who have actually died uh, in this, in this next, uh, during the next, let's say, 30 uh, years. And these people have no way of getting compensation or um, doing things to sort of revert to a situation without climate change. Yeah? So it's, it's, it's all based on this smooth, gradual, very mechanical uh, uh, process. So it's, it is also a fallacy of false precision, you could say. There is a big issue, I think most people would know, about which social discount rate to use. Uh, Nicholas Stern has famously argued for a very low social, rate of disc uh, social discount rate. Uh, Nordhaus 
is changing his discount rate all the time, lowering it, but not to 1% as uh, the Stern Committee has done. Uh, so there, there is also uh, some sort of a bias in uh, Nordhaus's work as it concerns the rate of discounting. Uh, fourth problem is not so widely recognized, but it is a problem. This whole notion that you first have to save in order to finance your investment is problematic to start with. Yeah, I mean, you can actually finance it by taking bank loans. And if these things work out, you can, you, you can pay back these loans and you don't necessarily need to save. Yeah, this is a very Keynes, this is not MMT, but this is simply a very, very Keynesian argument uh, that uh, banks pre-finance investment. Investment leads to incomes, incomes create savings, and banks get their money back. Yeah, this is uh, not uh, radical in that sense, uh, but it is something which the model does not allow. And then point five is that uh, the model also assumes that all the money we are spending today, all that money is very wisely, prudently, and efficiently spent, which is also uh, something of a problem. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, if you just think of all the cash and all the money which goes into not so productive financial uh, uh, instruments, uh, I, I think it is sort of fair to say that there is money floating around which actually could be used. The point is we can't get hold of that. Yeah, so that br brings me to the next slide. That is also something which I want to emphasize. That is, uh, I think most people would argue that if we try, I mean, the, whole, the, the budgetary cost, global budgetary cost of trying to keep warming down to less than 1.5 degrees is not excessive. Yeah, it is about maybe 3%, maybe on the high side, 4% of global GDP. That is a lot of money. But I mean, as, as a percentage of, your, of, of income, it is not so much. Yeah? Uh, and, uh, and especially, it is not so. I mean, th this is something which we have to invest and mobilize each and every year. But it is, uh, in my view, clearly a bargain. It's sort of worth it because we can actually prevent uh, potentially disastrous outcomes. Yeah? So this is, let's suppose it's 3%. Uh, it would be about 2.25%. A trillion dollars, maybe it's a bit more, but that that that's it. Yeah, and then the question is, can we do this? Can we sort of find funding? I just compared this three percent of GDP to uh, actual users of what how how we spend our money. Well, there is global military spending, very important. Uh, I don't think we can cut it. Uh, actually, it all looks like, I mean. Saudi, yeah, Saudi Arabia needs to have uh, this. I mean, it's very important for them. So, uh, so there is this, this this thing that that it looks like almost necessary expenditure. I mean, we we may, we may disagree, but uh, okay, it's quite a quite a lot. Yeah, it's not so useful. It's very dis distro I mean, it's also disastrous spending. But anyway, very interestingly, the fossil fuel industry is getting a huge. Uh, uh, amounts of implicit and explicit subsidies. And the, the number of 5% of GDP, which is $5.8 trillion, is not my uh, whatever uh, radical uh, estimate. This is actually from a very, very solid uh, international institution named IMF. Yeah, so it's their estimate of what the, uh, what the governments are paying implicitly and explicitly, directly, indirectly. Now, uh, there's also tax evasion by big corporations. Um, and uh, because of tax evasion or offshoring uh, tax havens, uh, governments are missing out on also, let's say, $1.2 trillion a year. This is some sort of an estimate. Yeah, I mean, I just, uh, in the Netherlands, where I come from, there's a big discussion because one of our biggest and most historically sort of prominent uh, um, uh, uh, corporations is the Royal Royal Dutch Shell. And actually, uh, it turns out that Royal Dutch Shell, even though it has its base in the Netherlands, is, p is paying zero euros of profit or corporate tax in the Netherlands. I mean, they are paying taxes elsewhere. They stick to the legal loopholes, or they say legal rules. Uh, but they, uh, so the, for the Dutch, I mean, it's like zero. They are not paying any uh, uh, profits, uh, tax on their profits. 
So that brings me to some sort of a summary, in, interim, intermediate summary, that is, I think uh, we see that uh, if we take the, even in a highly techno-optimistic scenario, uh, green growth is sort of hardly possible. And if there's no growth, it basically means that we end up in a world in which we have to uh, improve uh, outcome, uh, not by growing, not have growth for everybody, but what we can do is we can have growth for some groups, but that means no growth or degrowth for other groups. So it's a distribu distributional issue. Uh, it need not be a distributional conflict, but it clearly very easily is a distributional conflict. It is not just a conflict between the current generation and all future generations. It is a conflict between today's generations. And uh, now I come to the, uh, I mean, I have to switch from the climate thing to uh, the dual economy because I think this is occurring in a situation in which uh, our, I focus on the OECD countries, in which the OECD countries are having problems, uh, big problems, uh, even if we don't talk about climate change. And the big problem is uh, that uh, these economies are experiencing growing inequalities, polarization in jobs, uh, you, could say, you could talk about the vanishing middle cl class or the squeezed middle class. Uh, you can also talk about what, what, what I did in the paper about the dual, uh, dual economy. Yeah, what, is the, what are the causes of, these, of, of, these, of the tendencies of polarization between uh, a group of people with high incomes, uh, dynamic, they work in dynamic sectors, their jobs are all, often very strongly protected, they have all kinds of good facilities, good pensions. And then we have a big group of people, sometimes called the precariat, uh, who are sort of uh, not, uh, who are facing different uh, 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 challenges. Um, and what, what are the causes of this polarization or uh, the growth of the dual economy? Well, I think I, mentioned, I, I listed three. One is technological progress often uh, mentioned globalization, and the third one is policy. Now, technological progress is uh, much hyped. It's like, uh, okay, the, the robots are coming and they are stealing our jobs. And uh, no, I think that is partly true, partly not true. It is also an adjustment process. It's not necessarily true that these jobs will go forever. But I think the adjustment process is very uh, prominent or very, very important uh, because uh, there is, um, uh, people are pushed out of, let's say, more dynamic, uh, profitable uh, activities, mostly manufacturing and information, uh, because of productivity growth and uh, in, in a situation in which, let me summarize it, the social welfare state is not uh, doing its job or has, for, so, for all kinds of reasons, decided to not provide the necessary support. Uh, these people have to, f they find employment in mini jobs in all kinds of low productive and also low wage activities. Yeah, so it is not, technological progress itself is not necessarily a problem. Uh, the problem is how do we as a society and also as in, in terms of economic policy, how do we react or respond to it? So far we have responded in the wrong way and that has uh, sort of deepened the polarization. Globalization, same thing, I mean you can talk about the benefits of specialization, the benefits of uh, increasing trade. Uh, the, it's all true, uh, but it's also true that it leads to uh, dislocations, uh, sectors, industries going down, sunset industries, uh, and uh, it leads to very, very uh, strong uh, problems in terms of unemployment, sometimes very regionally uh, uh, focused, but also often times more general. Yeah, so this is, this is uh, the, these are very strong processes, uh, but I think the number three, that is the policy response, actually the most important. That is, how do we deal with these uh, drivers or with these changes which are to some extent maybe, uh, I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong with neither of them. The point is, how do we manage them? Uh, so far, we have uh, uh, decided not to manage them, which is also managing, but it's sort of managing by uh, default. Uh, and uh, I think we can do a better job. Yeah, the policy has the policy responses all over have been, especially br scaling down welfare states, um, uh, sort of trying to um, push, uh, create. I mean, p people will say try and create jobs, create employment, but it also means pushing people into jobs which are 
below their educational level, which are not very safe jobs, which are sort of not well paid, very temporary jobs. There's enormous growth of temporary jobs. Uh, and then that is in, its, in addition to fiscal austerity and stagnant uh, or and, and very restrictive monetary policies. Yeah, I will speed up. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm speeding up, I hope. Yeah, I think I can do it. Now, in a way, I already talked about this slide. It is, it's the same thing. The one, the one thing I want to emphasize is that a very recent OECD report uh, was published under the title under pressure, the squeezed middle class. And the, uh, I think one of the major things highlighted in that report is that middle classes in the OECD uh, uh, feel more insecure, economically speaking, and they, the, downward, the downside risk, I mean, there's a much, much bigger downward risk. If you lose your job, the, the impact is going to be much, much bigger, much harsher uh, than before. And that is happening in times when inequality is increasing. This graph is basically showing the difference between income growth of the top uh, 20 or top 10 percent and the middle classes, and you can see that inequality is growing. Now, uh, in this context of grow growing inequalities and polarization, that is a dual economy, uh, the governments in Europe, I mean, some of the governments in Europe which have gone for uh, uh, climate policies have actually adopted or tried to adopt exactly the wrong policies. Yeah, France is the best example. Uh, uh, Macron tried to introduce a tax on consumers. Uh, that is exactly those people who are already hurt by the dual economy. These people have to pay, relatively speaking, more uh, uh, for, carbon, for their carbon emissions than the rich people. And this is happening at a time when uh, the uh, ca the ta taxation on capital and the income is actually reduced. So you could say that many people in France feel that the social contract is broken. Now, this is the result. That is the Yellow Vests protest. Uh, uh, but it actually happened in other countries. In my country, the Netherlands, it, it happened as well. The uh, Let's say the right of center government in the Netherlands tried to introduce a carbon tax, not for firms, but for consumers. Uh, they lost the elections to a climate denying, climate change denying party who was saying it's all wrong. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, clearly, uh, let's say, uh, new right-wing newspapers try to stir this up and, and sort of say there's a popular revolt against uh, climate uh, action. The carbon taxation is dead in the water because the people don't like it, uh, and. Uh, Anyway, that is uh, also an interesting aspect of this. Yeah, there is clearly uh, much resistance to any uh, climate action. Now, this is a list. I will not go through the list, but there is a list of... It's not just the Yellow Vest protest in France. It happens in the US. It happens in Germany. The Alternative für, du für Deutschland uh, is outspokenly climate change denying. I mean, they, are, they, bas they basically favor coal. And in the... Uh, not Helmut coal, but... The, the brown coal, and uh, and we in the Netherlands we have the Forum for uh, de for Democracy, which is a right-wing populist party growing very rapidly, and they also want to get rid of the Paris Agreement. Yeah, so it's it is it's all over. I mean, I could have also included Denmark, and it, there are many more examples. Okay, so what is needed, and that this is almost my final uh, slide. What is needed is, we, we rather, I mean, we, the future has to be different. And we have to give up the idea that we are riding the horse and we are in control. We are not in control. Uh, the Earth system is actually uh, hitting back, and uh, it may hit back in ways which we cannot, uh, we, we cannot cope with or deal with. Yeah? It's like very, very uncertain and unpredictable. So we need drastic action. I made a list basically saying, well, we have to just force especially corporations, the most 100 most polluting uh, transnational companies are responsible for more than 70% of cumulative emissions since 1988. I mean, we can, we, we can make a start there. Yeah, they, they can, we can try and force them to adjust. Uh, that we don't do for, via carbon trading, that is clearly not working. We need carbon taxes, but we also need just direct intervention that is standards and well, stopping coal and so on. 
Uh, maybe we need to hold the corporations accountable and liable for what they do. Maybe, I mean, anyway, that's a big issue. We, st we have to stop the environmentally unfriendly subsidies to fossil fuel industries. And then I think what is very important is that we use, I mean, we try and devise institutional schemes to mobilize funds, not just to, for the green uh, transition or the green, uh, the renewable energy transition, but also to compensate the losers, the, the people who are not uh, in the uh, protected uh, dynamic uh, sector. That is in the dual, we have to take the dual economy into account and we have to go for welfare state redistribution. Yeah, I mean, otherwise popular support or popular uh, uh, backing for any of this, uh, or any of these measures uh, will not work. Yeah, we have to, it, it is not just a technical issue, it's not just an issue of funding, it is a, an issue which uh, in, involves also trying to sort out a major distributional uh, conflict. Yeah, the good news is that the international, it is being recognized, there is talk about the Green New Deal, uh, the International Labour Organization is also uh, arguing that uh, going for, uh, let's say, clean energy uh, would actually mean, uh, could be labor intensive, it could create many more jobs, and we have uh, calls in the US for a Green New Deal, and we have uh, globally, coming from the UNCTAD in Geneva, calls for a global Green New Deal. deal. Yeah, and it is much broader than just mopping up funds to invest in renewables. It, is, it has to do with how, we do, how do we distribute the gains and the pains, and that means uh, thinking in terms of revived, not necessarily the old uh, welfare system, but we need a revived and maybe uh, also redesigned welfare system uh, focused on uh, compensating people who lose out on this. Uh, I think it's very, very important that we uh, create for instance, very, very good public transportation, which is low carbon or zero carbon. I mean, how can you tell people not to drive a car when there is, and you live in the rural area and there is simply no public transportation? I mean, that is, that's not what, I think that's not what we should do in a decent uh, society. Yeah, the, the conclusion, I will not go through this list. It is just that uh, I'm not optimistic. I think there is no uh, time uh, or no, uh, re we, we, we cannot be pessimistic. I mean, that would be uh, just giving up, giving up. I think there's still space and time and possibilities. So we have to be realistic. Yeah, and realistic means recognizing, I mean, we are, that we are not in control of the horse. So what we should do is we should be very, very careful and prevent, I mean, the precautionary principle is very important. We should try and prevent uh, the worst, the risks of the worst possible. Uh, outcomes, yeah, being thrown off the horse or being thrown off the cliff. Uh, this is just the final thing. Uh, uh, if we don't manage, and I mean there are all kinds of reasons to be very, very pessimistic, uh, this might be uh, part of the story. If you are interested, this is my final word, you, I would sort of suggest that you go to the INET website where there is a whole debate on the issue, is green growth possible? Uh, I am on the pessimistic side. There are people who are slightly more optimistic. So, if you want to, if you want, if you don't want to end your Sunday morning in a very depressed state, it might be good to uh, visit that website. Thank you very much. Grazie, grazie, Professor Storm. Eh... Eh, apro subito la discussione, lo ringrazio moltissimo eh, a nome di tutti anche perché qua, abbiamo qua un piccolo e localizzato effetto serra, non so se l'avete capito per via delle luci, quindi doppio ringraziamento per la eh, complessità e la brillantezza dell'esposizione. Apriamo la discussione, prego. Small question. The first, you use the example of France, and you told you know, but in fact, I wonder, you know, France is getting something like 75 or 80 percent of its electricity from nuclear power, True. and I wonder if you've done any counterfactual calculations, assuming that the rest of the world had been less anti-nuclear and more thinking like France, and had switched to nuclear power uh, at the same time and at the same rate that France has, and which of course also implies why the tax 
on carbon in France by Macron was so stupid because what they really should have done is subsidize these people who need cars to buy electric cars because electricity in France is much cleaner than it's anywhere else. That's one question. The other question, however, goes in the other direction, which is more pessimism, which is your presentation was entirely focused on carbon emissions. You haven't said anything about other hothouse gases. And my understanding is that especially the natural gas industry, because of inevitable leakage, uh, uh, adds substantially to the problem, as does, of course, uh, the production of uh, beef because of cows and other animals emitting methane. And I wonder if you added these other things, whether they would change the calculations dramatically. E prenderei altre, un'altra domanda, se c'è, così we'll collect two yeah, or three yeah. questions. Eh, buongiorno, una domanda in italiano. Yeah. Uh, sono sono anche io pessimista come lei, perché mh, eh, credo per, per affrontare questo problema eh, sia necessario... Ehm, anche una, una pace nella, diciamo, sul pianeta Terra, nel senso che con la presenza di tutte queste guerre è quasi impossibile anche frenare certe produzioni. La produzione di armi belliche, per esempio, è una delle più inquinanti, credo, eh, che ci siano. Ecco, voglio sapere, vorrei sapere il suo pensiero su questo. Grazie. Ci sono altri? Uh, Shervas, I, I really want to congratulate you, it's fantastic. I, I think the image that you really want to send everybody on climate change is the boiling frog. As you know, we are all in the same yeah, yeah. boiling situation, but we're so comfortable. And then yeah. one day we will all be boiled, right? Yeah. I, mean, I mean, this is a really serious issue. Yeah, yeah. But the big problem, as you know, why we have denied it, is that there are some people who think that if we are all boiling, let's see which frog becomes boss first, that we're fighting each other, rather than concentrating on how to deal with this climate issue. And the, the, the point that I really want you to stress a little bit more, I think, if I, if I think I get you right, is that we have misspecified the problem. As long as economists use the word GDP as the measure of progress, we will never price in climate change because GDP does not price in resource deterioration and, and carbon pollution, right? So actually for the economists to switch their mind from the paradigm, you really need to get out of GDP, right? I mean, you know, as long as you're using the same paradigm, mm -hmm. you cannot solve the problem. And uh, what you're arguing, I'm supporting your argument, I'm just yeah. suggesting. Yeah, yeah, no, I get it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you uh, all for your for very uh, interesting uh, questions. Uh, I, th I start with uh, uh, your uh, second question, uh, which is uh, I looked at ener uh, basically energy uh, generation uh, that is about 75% or so of total. Uh, w w so it's the source of 75% of, let's say, uh, global emissions, but there are other sources. Uh, like transport, like uh, 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 sources which have to do with agriculture, with land management, uh, and um, with um, uh, yeah, with with, with such uh, such issues. And I think uh, you you see that it is indeed true that if you take these other uh, sources and some of these, let's especially when you talk about uh, different lands uh, like peatland or. And also deforest. I mean, the scale of de deforestation is, or the pace of deforestation is so fast uh, that is immediately having. I mean, it's, it's very. It's having a very strong impact on the uh, on, on on the growth of uh, carbon emissions. Same with peatlands. And so, one, once this starts to uh, temperature starts to rise, it be it these these um, not so much used lands uh, start to emit not just carbon, but very, very uh, much more uh, dif uh, uh, dangerous uh, greenhouse gases, which are sometimes 20 or 200 times as uh, uh, the potential in terms of global warming is, not, is compared to a carbon, uh, uh, carbon ton, uh, it is like 20 to 200, or sometimes 200 times more uh, dangerous, you could say. So in that sense, uh, if, if you include that, 
uh, it's, there's all the more the reason to be very pessimistic. Now, I, I also agree with you on, on, on the point of France. Yes, France, ha France has, uh, um, I think it's about 85% or so of its uh, yeah, electricity comes from, let's say, geothermal and uh, nuclear uh, energy, and that is sort of very, it doesn't, the emissions are very low. Now, um, yes, some people would argue, and I would not, uh, but that is not necessarily uh, uh, an economic issue. Uh, I mean, people would argue that you could, we could try and uh, reduce emissions or go, slow down emissions by going for more nuclear energy. I find that myself problematic um, because uh, there is always, I mean, there is nuclear waste. Uh, it is a, it's a very, very, I mean, people, it's, it, it, I think it's basically the same story as the NICS. We think that we can control it and we can't. Uh, you put differently two things, uh, you don't agree, but that is why, that, that is why I said uh, we, will, we will not agree on this. Two things, one is uh, I think uh, you need very, very strong, let's say, uh, almost police, uh, police state protection when it comes to nuclear power plants and the disposal and transportation of waste. And I think uh, having at the heart of your economy in this form of uh, nuclear power plants uh, some sort of a police state type of arrangement is not uh, what I would like to have in a democracy, let's say that is the first thing. And the second point has to do with, I think, uh, if we are honest, or let us, let us just look, put it like this, uh, let us ask insurance corporations, companies, to ensure uh, <coughs> possible damages coming from a nu nuclear uh, accident. And I think they are probably not willing to do this. So it is like with big banks, it's the same thing, same thing with too big to fail banks. That is, ultimately, society, the state is on the hook when there is a major accident. Which basically means that the whole thing is only doable because we subsidize it. We basically sort of, so I, anyway, I think, I think the cleaner, other sources of renewable energy have developed enough to be able to uh, take up most. There's always a problem of what they call, I mean, in my university, they always talk about intermittency. That is, uh, there are fluctuations in energy demand and energy supply. You, so you need a sort of backstop or backup power uh, production. Okay, but that is not 85%. Uh, on your question, uh, yes, I think uh, the point, of course, is that you see that, uh, I mean, first of all, uh, there is a big, big economic interest in uh, uh, having, uh, let's say, military or the equi uh, military equipment uh, 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 being built. Uh, I mean, uh, if, if in a very, very unhistorical uh, or a, a historical uh, world in which there were no wars, uh, clearly the, the the demand for weapons and arms and tanks and whatever was was it was not there, and we would not have military expenditures uh, the way we have. Um, I think we live in a time in which conflicts are growing, tensions are, are building up, so it is not very likely that we can reduce the, uh, let's say we, we can scale that down. But I think it is very, very important to be aware of the fact that we, are, I mean, at the end of the day, we as a society are deciding to spend money on this. And uh, okay, I mean, if there is a majority to, to do this, but uh, to do so, then we do so. But maybe if people become more aware that we can also change this, I don't know. But, but it is a big problem. Uh, thank you for your uh, uh, two questions. I, I agree uh, with the first one. I, uh, it's the, yeah, I think that is a, that's the current situation. Uh, on, the, on the GDP um, uh, measure, um, yeah, I'm, I, I, I think I, I would agree, but I'm not so sure whether it, if we change it, that is going to, that, that is, that is, so, that, that is a solution. I, I think that if we, I mean, if we talk about a green new deal or in the green industrial policy, I mean, if we can convince uh, or convince, if we can make it clear that uh, this would mean more jobs, decent jobs, not, not temporary flex jobs with low pay, 
but let's say good employment for skilled people or semi-skilled people, uh, even without much of an increase in GDP, so it would be a pure redistribution, I think people would sort of like it. And in, you, could, you could also argue that average standards of living or ab the situation of average people uh, increases. So that means on the one hand that we can give up the, the idea of uh, emphasizing to, uh, to, uh, to a too big degree uh, the, the, this notion of GDP. Uh, on the other hand, the notion of GDP is still, I mean, we still need income to redistribute. So in that sense, it is still, it's still, I mean, whether we, but I, I, I get your point that uh, GDP is when we do not include all the costs which of our activities, then uh, GDP is definitely an overstatement of the income we are earning. Yeah, we are earning, but it is at the cost of future earnings, which means, which means at some point the bill will be sent. Yeah. Grazie, grazie molte. Allora ringraziamo il professor Storm e arrivederci, buon pranzo.